1972 was the year of the team in the National Football League. 26 teams covered it the Super Bowl in autumn, but by Christmas, only four survived. One was George Allen's Washington Redskins. Just one thing, men. Play every play as a big play and keep coming on every play and we'll win! Yeah! Blocking the Redskin challenge in the NFC were the Dallas Cowboys, a team steeped in a winning tradition and the incumbent Super Bowl champions. Waiting at the end of the long, dark tunnel in the AFC were Don Shula's Miami Dolphins. Anxious to avenge their humiliation by Dallas in the Super Bowl, the Dolphins ready to embark on an historic season. After 40 years of waiting, the ugly duckling Pittsburgh Steelers realized a beautiful dream. It's down to one big play, fourth down and 10 yards to go. The Oakland Raiders have taken a 7-6 lead in a tough, tough football game that has featured nothing but staunch defense all afternoon. Hang on to your hats. Here come the Steelers out of the huddle. Terry Bradshaw at the controls. 22 seconds remaining. And this crowd is standing. 50,000 of them. Seen their team go behind by one point. And Bradshaw back and looking again. Bradshaw running out of the pocket, looking for somebody to throw to, fires it downfield. And there's a collision. As that, that's caught out of the air. The ball is pulled in by Franco Harris. Harris is going for a touchdown for Pittsburgh. Harris is going. Five seconds left on the clock. Franco Harris pulled in the football. I don't even know where it came from. Cuba was in a collision. There are people in the end zone. Where did he come from? Absolutely unbelievable. Holy moly. John Fuqua, apparently the intended receiver in a collision with a defensive man, and from out of nowhere came Franco Harris. And I believe he was riding a white stallion down the field, heading up Franco's Italian army, charging under the football, and galloping off into the sunset. <laughs> In this year of the team, 1972 also saw the rebirth of the run. The best beef afoot was primed and packed into offensive lines, ready to roll back and ravage the front fours and linebackers. Secondary, sitting pretty in cozy zone defenses, were no match for 260-pound earth movers with a full head of steam. Behind the blockers, tucked snug in their slipstream, came a runner, vanishing in their wake. While in years past, fans cheered for the bomb and marveled at a game of pass and catch, 1972 was a season on the run. Sometimes the quickest path to six points was a graceful leap or a desperation dive. Sometimes it simply took a lowered helmet and knocking heads. 1972 was a physical year. Prizes were rewarded not on grace, but on muscle. In 1972, every division winner but the 49ers had a thousand yard runner. And other teams that had little of anything else had one too. In Buffalo, O.J. Simpson's Heisman Trophy finally found wings. 
and behind a makeshift line, he ran for more yards than anyone else in the NFL. In New York, the Giants flashed into contention on the legs of Ron Johnson. The San Diego Chargers were a collection of merry pranksters, considered too weak to win, and they didn't. But Mike Garrett gained a thousand yards. In 1972, runners, receivers, linemen, and quarterbacks carried the ball. Quarterbacks in years past ran strictly from fear or as a desperate last resort. Now a defense splayed apart like a gaping wound, made an inviting target for a willing quarterback. And in 1972, no quarterback was more willing than Bobby Douglas of the Chicago Bears. Douglas parlayed his size, strength, speed, and straight arm into an incredible 968 yards rushing. His many doubters claim that he was more of a running back than a quarterback. But in the bare season of need, Bobby Douglas was the answer to his coach's dream. During the season on the run, it became increasingly difficult for receiver and quarterback to link up on pro football's most glamorous play, the home run bomb. The evolution of varied and sophisticated zone defenses constricted and choked off the long pass. At the snap of the ball, secondaries retreated in a backward ballet. And with feet moving like centipedes, they formed a barrier between ball and receiver. To penetrate this web, quarterbacks relied on their receivers' native skills. Often, only luck or a sure pair of hands separated a touchdown from an interception. The prime zone breaker in 1972 was a big, tough, tight end who infiltrated the dead areas of the zone and snatched away a ball up for grabs. The 49ers had such a man in number 82, Ted Qualick. For converting a routine turn-in into a touchdown, there were no players quite the equal of the Detroit Lions, Charlie Sanders, number 88, or the Atlanta Falcons, Burley Jim Mitchell, number 86. In a year when zones turned many quarterbacks timid, one man defied them. Joe Namath rolled back on creaky knees and still cranked out beautiful bombs with beautiful bounces. passes, runners, receivers, and strategies stir the fury of the fan, the team, not the play, was the thing in NFL 72. Twenty-six teams started in quest of the Super Bowl trophy. Many teams, with little expectations, stumbled quickly, while others saw their high hopes shattered by reality. For in 1972, many once proud and mighty teams fell from glory. Quarterback Roman Gabriel suffered a season in pain, and with their right arm severed, the Rams' season withered away. 
The rich traditions of the Baltimore Colts lay bowed and beaten by age, and serious contention collapsed in furious retreat. The summer forecast predicted that the Kansas City Chiefs would gallop to the Super Bowl. But their hopes melted away early, and all that was left was the despair of seven losses and the knowledge that their bitter rivals, the Oakland Raiders, wore the Western crown. Perhaps summer's sweetest dreams belong to the Minnesota Vikings. Minnesota always had defense. Now they had Fran Tarkington, and many said that when winter came, they would be champions. But when winter came, an old enemy had invaded their ice palace. After years of slumber, the Green Bay Packers awoke to claim another championship. The Packers' rebirth hinged on two age-old strengths, an awesome defense that pulverized quarterbacks, and a basic offense that ground down an opponent's will. The Packers' brutal hydra-headed running attack displayed the twin skills of MacArthur Lane, number 36, and John Brockington, number 42, on their heels, Green Bay steamed to another championship. While the Packers have scaled the championship ladder many times, the Pittsburgh Steelers had barely stepped off the bottom rung in 40 years. But in 1972, diminishing legions of Steeler fans became armies and their general was a 21-year-old rookie running back named Franco Harris. Harris rushed for over a thousand yards and tied Jimmy Brown's coveted record of gaining over a hundred yards in six consecutive games. With Harris as their catalyst, the Steelers were crowned champions of the AFC's Central Division. While Pittsburgh ended 1972 as Cinderella's, the Dallas Cowboys began the season as bona fide world champions. With a doomsday defense as their backbone, Dallas appeared to be on the verge of a football dynasty. Although Doomsday crunched and crushed, Dallas failed to win the East for the first time in six years. The Cowboys limped along until sore-shouldered Roger Starbuck mended for the playoffs against San Francisco. With Dallas trailing 28-13 in the third quarter, Starbuck's entrance heralded a stunning reversal of fortunes. Roger shook off a season's worth of rust and generaled Dallas to a field goal and a touchdown that cut the lead to 28-23. Dallas recovered an onside kick, and with 63 seconds remaining, Roger read the zone correctly and hit Billy Parks at the 10. With 56 seconds left, Starbuck struck Ron Sellers dead in the hands with a winning touchdown. Victory kept the embers of a Dallas dynasty faintly aglow. Next, they would meet a team of character, 
the Washington Redskins. One last thing. Keep your poise, but be physical, okay? <laughs> The heartbeat of the Redskins thundered under jersey number 43. Larry Brown was George Allen's 1,000-yard workhorse, and for every yard he gained, he earned another bruise. Just remember this, 40 men together can't lose, okay? These 40 men together became 39 when quarterback Sonny Jurgensen fell to injury. In his place stood indomitable Billy Kilmer, who refused to let his team fall apart. Kilmer often played hurt, but he played with heart, and Washington earned a well-deserved championship. Redskins faced the Cowboys for the NFC Championship. Men of character against men of the computer. A sweet day for Billy Kilmer. A bitter one for Tom Landry in Dallas. finally ended 26 to 3. Talk of a Dallas dynasty died and Super Bowl visions danced in George Allen's head. The AFC spawned the powerful Dolphins, a team idolized by Miami fans, a team who sought a perfect season. Miami's power resided in its ground game and a core of relentless runners. Inside came Larry Zonka, homing in on a collision course with the defense. Complementing Zonka outside was the flat-out speed of Mercury Morris. Zonka and Morris, Mr. Inside and Mr. Outside, two thousand-yard runners in the same backfield. The accomplishments of the undefeated Dolphins were revered at home, but belittled on the road, even though they easily whipped the Kansas City Chiefs on opening day, and rallied to defeat the Minnesota Vikings. Still, sports writers ridiculed their soft schedule, but while they whined, the Dolphins kept on winning. Even more remarkable was the fact that Don Shula, like George Allen, lost his number one quarterback. Into the void left by Bob Greasy stood Earl Morrow, a man accustomed to stepping into adversity. Guided by Morrow, Miami played letter-perfect football, and after 14 games, Don Shula's remarkable Dolphins were undefeated. In the playoffs, Miami showed a champion's medal by coming from behind to defeat both the Cleveland Browns and the Pittsburgh Steelers.
victorious in 16 straight games. The Dolphins came to the Super Bowl needing only a win over the Redskins to climax their perfect season. The Dolphins' no-name defense manhandled Larry Brown and snuffed out the Redskins' victory spark. While their defense held Washington scoreless, Miami's confident, well-disciplined offensive machine chugged up and down the Coliseum. dueled in the sun with the Dolphins ended in defeat and they became the 17th notch in Miami's gun belt. From the 26 teams that began the season, the list was winnowed down to one. In the year of the team, Don Shula's matchless Miami Dolphins were the team of the year. Sunday, January 14th, 1973, the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum. The dynamic rhythms of Super Bowl VII offered an interesting contrast. The enthusiastic Washington Redskins and the somber Miami Dolphins. The Dolphins were up from hard times. Born in expansion, they had struggled through four lean years of defeat while searching for strong-willed leadership. Then along came Don Shula. Shula had proven himself a winner in Baltimore, but a Super Bowl loss soured his Colt career. Now he would shape a new team to match his own square-jawed toughness. I'm about as subtle as a punch in the face, he said of his coaching method, and quickly the ragtag Dolphins fell into line. In just two years, Shula took his team from cellar to Super Bowl. Against the Dallas Cowboys, Miami took the field coolly confident and left it two hours later thoroughly beaten. Don Chula had suffered his second super put down, but he silently vowed that he wouldn't lose again. In 1972, led by an anonymous defense called No Name, Miami won 16 straight games, yet did so without celebration. They knew 16 in a row meant nothing without victory in the 17th. Blocking Miami's path were the Washington Redskins, another team with a checkered past. For 20 years, the Redskins had been scrimmage fodder for league champions, a perennial loser also in search of leadership. In this case, George Allen. Allen was Shula's antithesis, encouraging, cheerleading, cajoling, pleading, blending revitalized old Redskins with spirited new additions. Like Shula, Allen created a team in his own image, the Over the Hill Gang. Under Allen, Washington won the first Redskin Division Championship in history, then ascended to the top of the NFC. In just two years, Allen had performed a Shuler-sized miracle, and now he took time to celebrate. In the joy of the moment, the Redskins nearly forgot that one step still remained. Super Bowl VII would match more than bodies and game plans. It would test the strength of two clearly defined team personalities and the methods of two men who had shaped them. 
the computerized no names, and the romanticized over the hill gang. On this powder blue Sunday, the aqua white dolphins would attempt to settle a score which had haunted them for one year. The burgundy gold redskins would try to ride home on the emotional backwash of their sudden rise to power. Two teams out of a shadowy past to share this moment in the Super Bowl sun. Probing eye of a nation focused in on a nine inch strip of Coliseum turf, control of which would determine the game's outcome. In the first quarter, the confrontation was no contest as up and down the line the Dolphins took root and controlled scrimmage. The heart and soul of Washington ground power, Larry Brown, was confronted with a wall of red, his own blockers forming the barrier. While Miami stopped the redskin attack in the middle, number 32, Jack Pardee in the Washington defense sought to control the outside game. To do this, they keyed Miami's superb pulling guard, Larry Little, number 66. Pardee's first move on a sweep was to pick off Little and let the runner go free. Stripped of his escort, even big back Larry Zonka could be handled by tiny cornerback Pat Fisher and his quick feet. The no names were brilliant, but Pardee's over the hill gang matched them throughout a bruising first quarter. Faced with a defensive stalemate, the Dolphins turned to a different tact. A Bob Greasy to Paul Warfield pass is no surprise, except when delivered on first down. The out of character maneuver netted 18 yards and provided Greasy with field position to test the nemesis of his running game, Pat Fisher. Greasy sent Howard Twilley to the corner and delivered a perfect pass, just over a leaping linebacker and outside a beaten Fisher. Miami accepted the game's first score with typical reserve, but the two quick strikes had split open a defensive standoff and Washington surrendered the first small measure of psychological advantage. No name returned, determined to hold the newly forged lead. Their method would be the 53 defense, with Manny Fernandez settling head up over center and using his quickness to nearly beat Redskin backs to the handoff. The purpose of 53 was to predetermine Bill Kilmer's play calling, to set up the ball hawks of Miami's deep zone, to force Kilmer into third and long situations to test his arm early and often. Kilmer's third down pass had been intended for number 42, Charlie Taylor. 
but he found the middle crowded with dolphins, and Jake Scott pulled off a single-handed steal. The dolphin defense had called the shots, taken the ball from a frustrated quarterback and given it to a confident one. A fake pitch on second and two fooled the run-conscious Redskins again. And once more, it was Pat Fisher who got burned, this time by Paul Warfield. But after 20 minutes of perfect football, Miami had at last proved fallible. An illegal procedure penalty wiped out Warfield's touchdown. The setback might have caused a letdown, but middle linebacker Nick Bonaconte recalled the pain of a previous Super Bowl too vividly. The Dallas Cowboys had destroyed Miami in Super Bowl VI with cutback running. The Dolphins knew Larry Brown would test them with the same tactic. This year, they were ready. The Dolphins had drilled on maintaining precise pursuit angles, sealing off every avenue of escape front and back. This was team defense, each man's course coordinated with a teammate's. Eleven men on eleven paths of pursuit, all with one mission. Seek out Larry Brown and punish him. Once again, Miami had forced Washington's hand. With two minutes left in the half, Bonaconte sent Doug Swift in on a blitz, then dropped to the middle and waited. Bonaconte's interception told the whole first half story. Miami's cold persona had extinguished the fires of redskin spirit. Larry Brown had been dealt a game's worth of pain in just one half. George Allen's enthusiasm had turned to nervousness. Calmly, Manny Fernandez and Don Shula looked on as Miami offense secured the vantage ground. Jim Mandage came up with Greasy's sixth completion in six attempts. And then number 39, Larry Zonka, led number 21, Jim Kick, to a sliver of end zone daylight, and the half of Dolphin domination ended 14-0. Washington fans welcomed their stricken team back from intermission with a purpose. Emotion had brought them this far. Emotion could save them now. How about every damn guy in here now? Everybody listen to this. We've got 30 minutes to live. We've talked about character. We're going to see how much character every damn guy has here. Now let's hit somebody. And let's be proud of ourselves and be physical. First series on offense, first, first series, series on defense. defense. <laughs> Allen's oratory brought back the fire. And Kilmer came out swinging with an aggressive outside passing attack. Redskin receivers ran short outs underneath the Dolphin zone, and finally, Washington mounted a drive. With six carefully structured completions, Kilmer took his team the length of the field right up to touchdown's door. When it counted most, Redskin execution had faulted. Charlie Taylor was open for an instant, but stumbled just before the ball arrived. Still, Washington had one down left to recapture the emotional momentum which had brought them this far. Once again, Manny Fernandez assumed the role of spoiler. With hope for a touchdown buried beneath massive number 75, the Redskins would have to settle for three points on a Kurt Knight chip shot from the 25. 
But even this was not to be. Washington's most important drive had yielded nothing. The frenzied burst had withered as quickly as it had flared, and George Allen's 30 minutes to live was now down to 21. While despondent Bill Kilmer cooled his heels, calculating Bob Greasy moved in for the kill. But the determined redskin defense had already caught his act, and the element of surprise had flown. With the air attack becoming more hazardous, Miami turned to its broad background soldiers to put the game away. Zonka and Little had failed with sweeps in the first half, so now they turned to their brutally basic inside game, pounding away from tackle to tackle for short, savage games. Each Zonka blow softened Washington resistance. Then one play battered it into full retreat. Zonka's rambunctious 49-yard run seemed to settle the issue. All that remained was another pinpoint greasy touchdown pass. But number 23, Brick Owens, had a different idea. Owens' interception with eight minutes left gave Washington one more chance. One more chance for Larry Brown's aching legs to summon up lost power. One more chance for the offense to atone for three quarters of failure. This was Bill Kilmer's kind of game. Tough, brawling, rough hewn, but crudely effective. Helmet askew, belly protruding, socks sagging around his ankles, Kilmer was once again spiritual leader of the Redskins. Jerry Smith was wide open, but the ball never arrived. For between Kilmer and his receiver loomed yet another trick of the guards, the goalposts. Bill Kilmer's fate had been predestined, and on the next play, Miami sealed it for good. Jake Scott's second interception put the game in proper perspective. It had been a day of defense, Miami team defense. A defense intentionally constructed by Don Schuler without stars, for each no-name is part and parcel of a whole. But one man had stepped out of obscurity. Manny Fernandez fulfilled the lineman's dream by dominating the most important game of his life. Fittingly, this regal day of defense was crowned with Scott's interception, and Miami had all but secured the first shutout in Super Bowl history. remaining in the football game. A field goal here should ice it for the Dolphins. Yepremian's attempt will be from 34. Here's the snap. The kick is up. It's blocked. The football is loose. Yepremian's after it. He picks it up. What's he going to do? 
He's trying to throw it. The ball is batted up in the air. Picked off by the Redskins. Mike Bass down the sidelines. He should go all the way. Damn! What an incredible turn of events. Let me see if I can reconstruct what happened. Yepremian's field goal was low into the line. The kick was blocked. The ball popped loose. Garrow finally found the handle. And then he tried to throw a pass. His arm went forward. The ball didn't. Garrow batted it up in the air like a volleyball. And Mike Bass and the Redskins picked it up all the way down the sidelines for a Redskins touchdown. Suddenly, Washington is right back in the ballgame. It's 14-7 with plenty of time remaining. We got a lot of time. A lot of time. A lot of time left. Morris on a sweep to the right. He's brought down by Pat Fisher. The official rules that he's out of bounds. The clock is stopped. 151 remaining, second down and six. Bob Greasy drops back to pass. A dangerous maneuver deep in their own territory. It's complete to Paul Warfield. It looks like he has the first down. A big first down with 145 remaining. And somehow the Redskins have to get that football. Now we gotta think in terms of taking that ball away. See, taking that ball away. Make the tackle, but the second guy go for the ball. <laughs> The Redskins have to use up a vital timeout. It's third down and seven at the Miami 33. Uh, what, what yard line? I right, turn for kick. Morris again on a sweep to the right. It looks like he has some running room. Oh, he slips and falls. Down he goes. And now the Dolphins will have to punt. Play situations. Let's go. The Redskins are in a 10-man front. Here's the snap. And here comes the Army. Seifel barely gets it away. Now listen, you know, we're, this is a world championship. The 1972 season has come down to a final minute and nine seconds. Go oh, now, let's go, let's go, Billy Kilmer, come on, buddy! Pass! Kilmer drops back to pass, he throws, it's into the Washington bench area, nowhere near an intended receiver. Hey, Kilmer! That a bar, Kilmer! Washington is now out of timeouts. This could be the last play. Kilmer is back to pass. He's in trouble. He's trying to shake loose. He's wrapped up by Stanfield and Denherter. Down he goes, and that's it. The Miami Dolphins are world champions. Finally, it had ended. Emotion spent, the Redskins realized, as had Miami the year before, that reaching this game meant nothing without final victory. Washington's powder blue Sunday was now backlit with failure, while Miami's year of doubt had ended in the sun. Don Shula had wiped clean a clouded past. His team had established an incredible precedent for the future. Don Shula and the Miami Dolphins, undefeated champions of the world. This NFL Films production has been brought to you by the National Football League. The NFL is online at www.nfl.com.